This morning, we are looking at uh, the second chapter of the book of Haggai, which I preached in the morning service uh, on a couple of weeks ago. And I didn't complete it. I just shared with you uh, from the first few verses of the book of Haggai about how God had given the Jews in captivity an opportunity to return to their nation, to return to their homeland, which was in ruins. And they were sent back, they were equipped, and they were sent with a specific purpose to build the temple of the Lord. But after getting off to a flying start, they did not complete it, and they brought an excuse to the Lord and said, this is not the time. Subsequently, in the first chapter of Haggai, God speaks through the prophet to the people, and he tells them that they must consider their ways, they must consider the state of their life, they were going through economic hardship. They were sowing, they were sowing, but they were not reaping. They were eating and drinking, but they were not satisfied. And uh, God describes what happened to them, their economic condition, saying that they, it was as if they were putting their money into a pocket which had holes. And then God goes on to tell them that it's not the devil, it's not the enemy. You don't have to pray for breakthrough, it is I who is sending a drought. It is I who is blowing away your earnings. It is I who is responsible for every hardship that you are going through. And that really shatters our picture of God because we think that God is there to make us happy. God is there to comfort us, to strengthen us. God is there to make everything right. But here we see a picture of a God who in, in the purpose of restoring people to having their right priorities, actually not just allowed, but sent difficulties into their lives so that they would reflect, they would consider, they would evaluate themselves, they would see something is wrong, something is wrong here, and the reason that something is wrong is because God is sending it into my life so that I might rearrange my priorities and give him first place. And then, as the people heard these words that Haggai shared with them, we see something very unusual for the prophetic books. They actually obeyed. Most of the time in the Old Testament, the prophets were sharing and admonishing and advising the people, but they didn't pay any attention to them. But in the book of Haggai, we see a positive response in that the people heard what Haggai said and they actually obeyed and they, they obeyed the Lord, they feared his presence and God promised that he would be with them and that he would send his spirit to stir them up so they, they could do the work that he had called them to do. And so that is the place at which we end the first chapter of the book of Haggai. This morning we are reading from chap uh, chapter 2 verse 1 down to verse 9. In the seventh month, on the 21st of the month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people, saying, Who is left among you who saw this temple in its former glory? And how do you see it now in comparison with it? Is this not in your eyes as nothing? Yet now be strong, Zerubbabel, says the Lord, and be strong, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and be strong, all the people of the land, says the Lord, and work, for I am with you, says the Lord of hosts. According to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remains among you, do not fear. For thus says the Lord of hosts, once more, it is a little while, I will shake heaven and earth, the sea and dry lands, and I will shake all nations, and they shall come to the desire of all nations, and I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, says the Lord of hosts. As we open the book of Haggai, and he speaks to these people who said, now is not the time to build the temple of the Lord. Haggai said that because these people had a certain mindset at that time. 
The fact that they were saying this is not the time to build the temple of the Lord, but they did consider it the time to build their own homes and attempt to live in luxury in their paneled houses, as Haggai describes, shows us that they were a people who were disinterested in the work of the Lord. And so it is to that uh, attitude of disinterest that Haggai spoke initially and showed them that it was wrong for them to place more importance on their own personal things and they needed to change their priorities, get their life in order and be interested in the work of the Lord as the foremost priority of their lives. And so as Haggai speaks these words to them, they accept his words and they obey it and they begin their work on the temple. And then it is a couple of weeks later that God gives another message to these same people through the voice of Haggai. But this time, when Haggai speaks to them, they have changed from being a disinterested people, but a new emotion, a new attitude has developed inside of them, and it is to that attitude that Haggai's next prophecy is addressed. If you look at verse 3, Haggai says, Who is left among you who saw this temple in its former glory? And how do you see it now? In comparison with it, is this not in your eyes as nothing? You see, the temple that they were referring to, which had been broken down, was a temple that was built by Solomon. Solomon was the king, and he spared no expense and no labor in building a beautiful temple that would house the presence of the Lord. And we read uh, in the Old Testament how the temple was dedicated and the beauty and the fanfare and all the festivities that accompanied the dedication of that beautiful temple to the Lord. And that was the temple that many of these people remembered as the temple of God from which they were taken uh, and, and they were taken as captives. And when they returned to this place, that temple was destroyed and they had a new mandate, which was to rebuild a new temple from rubble. And you know, uh, when I shared from Haggai chapter 1, I read to you the parallel passage which is narrated in Ezra chapter 3, which talked about the laying of the foundation of the new temple. And if we turn to that once again, we begin to see two different sets of emotions displayed in the people when the foundation of the second temple was laid. Ezra chapter 3 and verse 11 says, now this is at the dedication or the laying of the foundation of the new temple. And they sang responsively, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and his mercy endures forever towards Israel. Then all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. Verse 12. But many of the priests and Levites and head of the fathers' houses, old men who had seen the first temple, wept with a loud voice when the foundation of this temple was laid before their eyes, yet many shouted aloud for joy. So that the people could not discern the noise of the shout of joy from the noise of the weeping of the people. For the people shouted with a loud shout and the sound was heard afar off. So you see, when the new temple was being built, there were some old people, old in age, maybe not in attitude, but just old in age, because they remembered the former temple, they had been taken to captivity, and now they returned and they were present at the rebuilding of this new temple. And so we find that some of them found this to be a new experience, the, obviously the ones who had been born in captivity, and they were delighted and they rejoiced when the new foundation was being laid. And then with the sound of rejoicing, we read in Ezra that some of the people were weeping and the weeping and the rejoicing mixed together and there was a great sound and you could not discern between those who were happy and those who were sad. But you see, 
it's a natural feeling, but really what was happening there was that the people who remembered the old temple were comparing the former temple with the new temple. They were comparing these two buildings. And as they compared them, there was really no comparison because one had been built by a king with all the resources that he had. And the rest, the, the new one was being built by a group of returning refugees. We know what their economic condition would have been, right? So there's really no comparison between the two buildings. And here are these people comparing them and weeping. And that comparison is really what led to the attitude of their heart that Haggai was addressing. It was an attitude of discouragement. And that's why Haggai says, verse 3, how do you see it now in comparison with it? Is this not in your eyes as nothing? What had happened? They saw the glory of the former temple, and then they saw the humble beginnings of a new temple, and when they compared the both, it was so stark in its comparison that they felt that it was like nothing, no point, this is so useless, and they were encompassed with a feeling of discouragement. Discouragement is no stranger to anyone who has ever attempted to serve the Lord. Am I right? Discouragement comes to one and all. But here, the discouragement came because of their attitude of comparing. And it shows us that comparison in anything is generally a killer of our joy and our motivation. In their case, they were comparing an old building with a new building. Sometimes that is plain and simple, the comparison. We also have an old building and a new building, right? So these are not feelings that we are strangers to. But just remove the building out of it, the fact that in the service of the Lord, when we begin to compare ourselves or compare things with one thing with another, that comparison very often sucks the joy, sucks the motivation out of our service unto the Lord and leads us to a place of discouragement. Sometimes we compare the glory days with the days now. We compare how certain meetings used to be 20, 30 years ago and then we compare it with how things are happening now. Sometimes we compare ourselves with other people who are serving the Lord. We compare and we wonder, how come that person is like this and I am like this? Sometimes we compare what people do for the Lord and the fruit that comes out of it. We compare the gifts and the abilities that people have received from the Lord and it leads us to discouragement. Sometimes we compare the fruit of our labors also. This one hardly works and look at the place he is getting. But I am doing all this, nobody sees, nobody cares, nobody knows. We have all these kinds of feelings, right? And when we begin to do that, what happens? We lose the joy because we always think the grass is greener on the other side. You know how we are all from different families? And all our families have these little idiosyncrasies, you know, quirky things sometimes. But we put up with all of those and we are loyal to that because that is our family. Right? And we don't take the view that my family is better than every other family. We realize that this is my family, I am different, our family is different from your family, that's how you do it in your family, this is how we do it in our family. Everything doesn't have to be I'm right, you're wrong. But we can appreciate that this is where God has called me to be, so when I'm in this family, I'm not going to get jealous about what that family is doing. So let's ask the Lord to help rid us of this comparative spirit because we don't want to have this idea of comparing ourselves with people, with ministries, with churches, with families, with gifts and abilities and opportunities because when we do that, the enemy gets in into our lives to discourage us. But here, unfortunately, because of their comparison, 
we have a very discouraged lot. And then in verse 4, we find what Haggai tells them. He says, Yet now, be strong, Zerubbabel, says the Lord. Be strong, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. And be strong, all you people of the land, says the Lord, and work, for I am with you, says the Lord of hosts. Why did God speak individually to all these people and tell them, be strong? Be strong, Zerubbabel, he was the governor. Be strong, Joshua, he was the high priest. Be strong, all the people. I'll tell you why. Distinguishing this way of writing from all the other passages in this book where he speaks to all three groups of people. Because everyone from the top to the bottom has a tendency to get discouraged. We all get discouraged over different things and in different ways. But that, that feeling of discouragement is a temptation that comes to each and every one of us. And God recognizes that. We don't have to be ashamed about it, but we can realize that his word speaks to us. And what did Haggai say? He said, be strong. And it sounds like such a simple thing. And you know, sometimes you are going through a problem or you're going through some difficulty and you might share it with somebody and they might say, be strong. You know, as if just saying that, like as if you didn't know that you have to be strong and get through this. They're saying it with every good intention, but somehow the words don't bring you comfort because you feel like you already know it. And what do those words do? But actually, these are loaded words. Because if you think for a moment, when we want to have a strong body, our physical bodies, there are primarily two things that we do. There might be so many, but primarily two things. One is we eat nutritious food, or at least we tell people eat nutritious food, right? Secondly, we exercise, or we tell people to exercise. So we talk about exercise, or we watch exercise, or we read about it. But to be strong, you have to eat nutritious food. It's your vegetables, you know, your fruit, and you have to eat non-fatty meat and all these things, you have to eat good, nutritious food to be strong in your body. In the same way, to be strong in your spirit, you have to eat good, nutritious, spiritual food. And I want to share with you that the most nutritious spiritual food that you can find is found in here, directly in here. And I'm telling you that because, you know, some of us like to eat desserts, right? Brownies, chocolate eclairs, cakes, and you know, there are some people who eat more of those than the main meal. So we also have desserts and treats, like Christian books, messages shared by other people, devotionals, encouraging testimonies and thoughts that people share. But that is not your main meal. Your main meal is the word of God. And just like you cannot survive on brownies and chocolate eclairs, you cannot survive on a spiritual diet of testimonies and Christian books and, you know, other people's encouraging stories. You cannot even survive on coming on Sunday and this being the only time you hear the word of God. That is why we are not strong, because we are not putting the right nutritious food into our lives on a daily basis. So no matter what anybody tells you, you have access to God, direct access to God. You don't have to go through anybody. And you have access to him through his word. So pick up his word daily, multiple times a day, and get it into your head and your heart. There is no shortcut to being strong. Amen. Secondly, exercise. What is exercise in the kingdom of God? So we learn the word, we put the word into our heart, and then we are expected to utilize it. It's like we eat all the food, and then we have to have some way to put it out to exercise, to take a bike ride or a walk or something like that. So exercise in the kingdom of God 
is serving the Lord. Taking all the knowledge that you have received, all the deposits of the word of God in your life, and beginning to put it into practice by serving the Lord and serving his people as a lifestyle. But there are some people who eat a lot and never exercise. Right? I'm talking about the physical bodies. You eat a lot, you never exercise. And just like that in the kingdom of God, there are a lot of people who eat a lot and never exercise. And we have a special word for them. They are called consultants. <laughs> they have all the knowledge because they have absorbed a lot of the word of God into their heart. So they know a lot. But they haven't done anything. So, it is their role in life to tell others how to do it. And you know what happens when you're a consultant in the kingdom? Is that you get discouraged and you discourage others. So don't be a consultant. Exercise everything that you learn and serve the Lord. You wonder why you are not strong? You wonder why you are discouraged? Self-check on what I'm sharing with you this morning. Only you will know the state of your heart and life. Verse 4, he says, be strong and work. So here we are re-emphasizing the concept of exercise and serving. Work. And you know why Haggai had to say such simple things to these people? Because typically, when you are discouraged, you want to quit, right? Any time we are discouraged about anything, the first thing we think of doing is taking a step back. When you are discouraged in the service of the kingdom, the greatest encouragement that I can give you is to keep on working. Because when you work, you silence the voice of the enemy, you silence the sound of discouragement in your ears, because you are busy in the work of the Lord. So you don't have time to be discouraged. You don't have time to consult. You don't have time to discourage others. Because you're busy doing what God has called you to do. So especially if there is anyone here this morning, and for some reason you're discouraged about your ministry, or you're discouraged about some aspect of your service to the Lord, and you're considering whether you should go forward or not, I want to tell you a thousand percent from the work of God, word of God, this is not a time to take a break, this is a time to work. And as you begin to work that, you will see the hand of the Lord in your life. And why did Haggai say this with such conviction? He said it because at the end of verse 4, it says, God said, for I am with you. I'm with you. I'm not expecting you to be strong in your own strength. I'm not ex expecting you to work in your own strength. But I am telling you that I am with you. And when he says, I am with you, he goes on to describe the covenant relationship that he had with the children of Israel as they left Egypt and the promise that he gave them. And he says in verse 5, according to the word that I covenant with you when you came out of Egypt so that my spirit remains among you, do not fear. And he's really talking about these beautiful words in Exodus chapter 29. And verse 45, which says, Exodus chapter 29, verse 45, it says, I will dwell among the children of Israel, and I will be their God. And they shall know that I am the Lord their God, who brought them up out of the land of Egypt, that I may dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. His promise still stands. His word still stands. He will dwell among us. He will be with us. But he takes it one step further. You see, when he spoke to the children of Israel, at this time, the Spirit of God had not yet come to them in all its fullness, in all his fullness. So he says that I, my Spirit remains among you. Do not fear, verse 5. But now... His spirit doesn't just remain among us. His spirit is in us. Amen. 
We carry His Spirit wherever we go. His Spirit is not limited to this place where we worship together. His Spirit is inside me because I am the temple of the Holy Spirit. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And wherever you go, you carry the Spirit of God with you. And you carry His glory and His presence. He is with you. Do not be discouraged. Haggai goes on to say in verse 6, For thus says the Lord of hosts, Once more, it is a little while, I will shake heaven and earth, the sea and dry land, and I will shake all nations, and they shall come to the desire of all nations, and I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. And here, after speaking to their discouragement, and after showing them how to be strong, and how to work, how to know that he is among them, and that his spirit is among them, Haggai begins to talk about what is happening, and what is to come, and he is calling people to just have a vision of the glory, glory of God and recognize that, that despite the building, you know, God was at work in their midst and that he was going to continue to work in ways that they didn't even understand. When, when in uh, ancient texts this, this idea of I will shake uh, is there, it is really a uh, uh, um, an idea of a deity manifesting himself. So the, the, uh, the, the idea of I will shake is that, you know, the God, the God is, is showing himself or doing something to make his presence known. And God promised that even in that place, though it didn't look like Solomon's beautiful temple, that his glory and his presence would be there in a beautiful way because God is not bothered about buildings. God is not limited by buildings. Today in our nation and all over the world at this very time, people are meeting in different kinds of buildings, in open air, by the riverside, in mud huts, in all kinds of places. And the Spirit of God is present in that place. Amen? He is not limited or boxed in by buildings made with our human hands. We do it beautifully because we want to bring to our God the best that we can. But he doesn't dwell in buildings made of stone. He dwells within the hearts of man alone. And here, Haggai was trying to infuse these discouraged people with the hope and expectation of the glory of God. And we see in verse 7, Haggai talks about the desire of all nations. It says, I will shake all nations, and they will come to the desire of all nations. Who is the desire of all nations? Jesus. Jesus was to be revealed. Still, he was not revealed here, but he was to be revealed. And when he came and when he died on the cross, for, he would die for the sins of all humanity, and all nations would be brought into the kingdom. This was a, uh, an idea that the Jews could not comprehend because they thought that the good news was just for them. So they didn't understand what Haggai was saying when he says that he will come, they will, the, all nations will come, and Jesus was called the desire of all nations. And uh, so this was, uh, these, these few verses are like layer upon layer of different events, and the Jews, as they were being spoken these words, they didn't fully understand what was being spoken. It is only that we, in retrospect, can look back and see the fulfillment of these prophecies and interpret them correctly. But they didn't understand. But an interesting thing is that this very temple that they built, though it was not such a beautiful one at that time, Jesus would be in this very temple because this is the temple that was standing when Jesus walked the earth. So just imagine the glory of that place when the Son of God entered that place. They had no idea that this is what was to come. And now we are in the church age where, you know, God is manifesting his glory among us in, in, in beautiful ways each and every day, and we are experiencing the power of the Spirit of God, and we are experiencing a, a move of his Spirit. And 
oftentimes we try to think that if nations, things are going well in nations, then God is at work. But I think we need to open our, uh, the eyes of our understanding to, to realize that sometimes when nations are in shambles and uh, when the things are as bad as they could be, that is when you see the hand of God, that's when you see the glory of God. And when we look at scripture, we see that as we get towards the coming of Christ, this world will get more wicked. This world will become worse. It's not going to get better people are going to get worse and we know that every day there are new kinds of crimes new levels of wickedness that people are going to but along with all these terrible things that are happening in our world the kingdom of Christ marches on and we experience his glory we experience his goodness and we experience his presence in our lives and that will go hand in hand until the final shaking which will be the coming of Christ and we cannot comprehend what it really is, what it really will be to see him in all his glory. Right now we have a little glimpse of his glory, more than some of the Old Testament saints had. But we have no idea how glorious it will be when he comes to meet us and we see him face to face. So here is Haggai speaking these words and, and sharing these words with these people who could not comprehend it. And he says in verse 9, The glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts, and in this place I will give peace. Just like the Jews could not comprehend what is to come, just like they could not understand that all nations would be Welcome in the kingdom of God, just like they could not really understand what the coming of the Messiah really would be and what, what would happen as Jesus walked on this earth. Now, looking back, we have all that knowledge. We have all that has been written in the word of God and what has taken place in history. But looking forward, we also cannot com comprehend what glory is going to be like, what it is going to be like when these words come to pass in their full completion. But for the moment, we are living in this in-between time, looking forward to the second coming of Christ, but looking to experience the glory of God in all his fullness that he will deem to share and reveal with us in our lifetime. I just want to encourage us this morning for those who are discouraged comparing things with maybe events of the past, ministries of the past, different, different things can come into our minds and uh, cause us to be discouraged, cause us to sometimes think God is not doing anything. God is not at work. God is at work. But it is to the extent that we open ourselves to his working that he will work in and through us for his glory. And I have a great desire this morning that from generation to generation there should not be a watering down of the Spirit of God and a looking back on glory days. But there should be a great sense of thankfulness for how far God has brought us, but a yearning for something more. And a yearning for even our young people and our children to experience God in a greater way than we did. And see his glory poured out in a greater way. To see God moving in, in, in marvelous ways and filling them and anointing them and setting them on fire because how else are they going to reach the next generation of people who have turned their faces away from God? They need a super empowering of the Holy Spirit, greater than we had. And especially as those from the previous generation, we don't want to look upon what God is doing now and weep and say it's not as good as it was. We don't want to be discouragers. We don't want to be dampers on those who are opening their eyes now and seeing what God is doing in their midst and getting excited about it. But we want to be encouragers and we want to be firelighters 
and we want to continue to experience the marvelous presence of God in this place and to every place where God sends you. You're just here for a few hours and then you go out to some other place where you have to be the glory of God in that place.